Okay, why don't we get going? Thanks everyone awesome. for joining this today. Uh, I'm happy to introduce Akash Jain uh, with uh, this presentation on breaking into venture capital. So Akash Jain is an investment principal at VU Venture Partners. Akash founded the Chicago Booth Angel Network of Silicon Valley and sits on the diligence committee of the local chapter, passionate about the startup ecosystem. Akash has also been deeply involved both operationally and as an advisor to several seed and growth stage startups, predominantly focused on the fintech and consumer verticals. Earlier in his career, Akash developed algorithms for automated trading at Morgan Stanley and served as an investment banker to fintech companies at FT Partner. He holds a master's degree in business administration from the Booth School at the University of Chicago and a master's in computer science from Cornell University. Akash was a member of the founding class at Jacobs University in Germany, where he earned a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering and computer science. Just really quickly about myself, I graduated Chicago Booth in 2011. I have been in a few different fp a roles in Silicon Valley, including at Juniper Networks, Groupon, Yelp. Now I'm at Infoblox as a director of technology finance. I lead a global team there. And uh, that's about it in terms of the intro. So why don't I pass it off to Akash and he can dive Great. into breaking into venture capital. Thanks, Akash. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Ranga. Thanks for the introduction. Um, I hope uh, everyone can hear me fine. If not, just uh, raise your hand or you know put something in the Q&A section um, in the chat. Um, this, I have about 30 slides, so we're going to try and, you know, get through them in the next hour or so. Uh, we might end up going a little bit over. Um, so, um, you know, I, I hope that works for everyone. Um, just a few caveats before we get into the, the presentation, you know, a lot of this, most of this material is really just my own biases and my experience. So, um, it's very much a personal sort of, uh, uh, testimonial on, breaking into venture capital, doing venture capital, you know, uh, the industry as a whole based on like the way I've seen it. Um, it's obviously influenced a little bit by journeys of several sort of industry incumbents uh, that I've read about, that I've seen, uh, friends, colleagues, classmates from Booth, classmates from, you know, my other sort of um, educational backgrounds and acquaintances. And um, a lot of them are, have over time spent, you know, um, done a little bit of angel investing. A lot of them are in VC and um, I've obviously borrowed um, what I've noticed from their own journeys. Um, and yeah, I obviously welcome a lot of feedback, uh, discussion and your perspective. Um, um, we'll do a Q&A session at the end as well. So uh, I wanna make it as interactive and as engaging as possible and also informative for everyone on this call. Um, so Ranga already mentioned, I guess like, you know, a little bit about my background, I can just quickly cover it as well. Um, as you mentioned, I, I got my undergrad from Jacobs University in Germany. Um, that's really where I was, I guess, bitten by the startup bug, but mostly because I was part of the founding class of the entire university. Um, and, you know, you can imagine that that was quite an interesting de decision. Um, and the backstory there is that I was already in Germany um, doing my high school there. And uh, my options were really twofold to either come to the US and pursue CS here at um, um, University of Illinois or UT Austin, or go to the startup university. Um, so I did, you know, the standards of due diligence that one does when get wanting to get involved with the startup. And I guess like at that relatively young age of 17, I already, I already had like that wanting to break free from the mold and the risk appetite to want to do something different. And luckily my parents sort of backed me up to do that. Um, and it was literally even till date, one of the most exhilarating, one of the most fun experiences um, that I've had. And I think that sort of like really colored everything else I've done after that. So when I went to Cornell to get my master's, um, took a relatively non-standard path, got super involved with student teams there. I spent you know one year working on the car team um, as, as the only sort of ele electronics and CS guy, um, most of my friends would advise me not to do that because it takes up a lot of time and it potentially doesn't give you enough time to recruit. But 
um, I guess I've always been a proponent of learning by doing and getting involved in uh, real projects and applying what you're learning in real time. Um, and again, I credit that a lot to like Jacobs where um, it's, you know, part of the whole startup culture where you, you just kind of like go for it and build stuff uh, and there's no precedent before you and you just become resourceful and figure stuff out. Um, that also really helped me um, in my career at Morgan Stanley. I actually started at Morgan Stanley without knowing a word of finance. Um, and, you know, I was literally plonked onto the trading floor on like month three to build bond analytics. Um, but obviously I, I knew how to code and, you know, how to be an engineer. Um, so over time, you know, I spent almost seven to eight years at Morgan Stanley um, building algorithmic trading systems for fixed income. Um, the financial crisis was actually a blessing in disguise for me. So while the rest of the bank was suffering, our group was constantly growing and we were, you know, driving not only PNL, but also like huge sort of digital transformation efforts for the firm. And I think that's where it became increasingly clear to me that, you know, fintech really is here to stay and it's really changing the way people think about finance and uh, fundamentally everything that we've seen happen over the last 10 years to like, um, I guess the world shifting away from big banks and the rise of the Robin Hood culture was pretty apparent directly coming out of the financial crisis um, back in the day. It just, it takes a while for these companies to develop. And um, and I guess I wanted to be part of that wave. Um, I was in London at Morgan Stanley. I didn't really know how to be part of that wave. If I wanted to be in, a, in an operating company or if I wanted to be a VC, um, you know, there, there were a few different things that I wanted to do. A, come out to California, B, get a um, little bit more of a sort of um, a well-rounded education. I came from a very technical background with finance layered in that I'd learned um, on the job. So I felt that an MBA would be like a good sort of uh, rounding off degree um, and also get me closer to, you know, some of the strategic decision makers in my future role at companies that I would take up and also just provide a great launch pad to potentially pursue a career in, um, in Silicon Valley. Um, in turn, when I was at Booth uh, at a growth equity firm in Chicago called Jump Capital, they were just starting out. They were literally in like year one back then. Um, now they're pretty big, which was actually a really interesting experience. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more, you know, um, if uh, the pros and cons of interning in, at an existing VC firm. Um, but anyway, so after Booth, came out to San Francisco, did uh, investment banking for fintech companies. So this was, you know, when I say investment banking, really it comes down to um, growth equity, IPOs, m and is completely focused at fintech. Um, one of the, I guess the smallest deal I did was a $15 million series A. So very sort of, you know, startup mindset -y where you're advising CFOs and CEOs of relatively young companies all the way to like doing um, m and for like $4 billion publicly traded companies. So it was just a really, really great learning ground to learn how uh, private capital markets work. Um, along the way, while I was in SF, I had started to, you know, really make an effort to get more and more um, involved with the startup ecosystem, worked with several companies such as Airport Sherpa, Matchplace, Tawala, which is founded by one of my classmates. Um, they recently announced a Series A, uh, $20 million Series A. Um, and also two years ago, founded the, the Angel Network, the Booth, Chicago Booth Angels Network, um, which is, you know, which some of you guys might be, might know about or be affiliated with. Um, and if not, you guys should definitely look into that. Um, and then shortly, round about this time when I founded the, the Angel Network, which is about two years ago, um, I, I came across Venture University. They were just starting out. Um, both Venture University and VU Venture Partners, basically sister organizations. And, you know, that's where I work now for the last two years. Um, so we're both an investor education program and also seed and Series A focused uh, uh, VC fund. So that's quickly um, a quick overview of my background, you know, combines, I guess, startup operator experience, um, engineering, finance. Um, and I feel like Venture really allows me to bring it all together in a really fun way. Um, and that's what we're going to talk about in, in this conversation today. Um, so I think like one of the questions I had two years ago as I was looking to, you know, eventually make the leap into venture capital. And I thought that I checked all the boxes and basically acquired all the skill sets. Um, but I didn't really know how to make that final leap. And I think 
one big part of like the soul searching that I did was, I think the thing that was holding me back from making that leap was I didn't really know myself what venture was for me. There are not a lot of um, role models or precedents like say consulting or banking where you can talk to a lot of seniors and you know other people who like followed that path and get like a full lowdown. Um, venture is a pretty small industry and not a lot of us know a lot of people who've done it and done it for a long enough time. So um, I think I had to first convince myself that like this was, I was also like in my mid thirties at that point, I didn't really want to like um, take, you know, just jump into a career and then discover if it was for me or not. So I did a little bit of soul searching in terms of like, what is it that people who want to break into venture, what is it that they actually, uh, you know, what are their interests uh, from a more sort of holistic perspective? Um, and as part of that research, I actually came across some stuff that, um, you know, that career service that Booth has put out uh, where they spoke about like, Typically, people who want to get into venture, you know, their interests are they're super interested in having enterprise control. They like being in charge, making decisions, owning the process. Um, I guess the flip side to that is being, um, you know, somewhere in middle management or be wanting to basically be told what to do. Venture is definitely not that. It's extremely um, self-driven and you get to even the, you know, the most junior employee call it an analyst. Uh, while they have to do a little bit more support and like back office stuff they're still expected to source deals and deals that they source are expected to run all the way through and potentially push for investment, which is basically the same thing that the most senior person, the founding partner would do, right? So um, so there's that level of enterprise control. Um, venture is very much a people business. So there's a lot of, uh, you know, influencing through language and ideas. Um, it is a deal-making business. You're convincing founders that, A, I mean, you're first like knocking down doors to like find founders. Uh, but then B, you're also convincing them to take capital from your fund, particularly in com competitive deals. And then once you invest in companies, you're convincing the entire world that your portfolio company is great and that they should help them out and potentially invest in them. So it's very much a, you know, a people business. Uh, but then there's also reason about quantitative analysis. I mean, at the end of the day, you are managing money and, um, you know, there's, there's certain IRRs and certain target returns that you, that you want to be able to target with the amount of capital that you have in your fund. So there's a reason a lot of modeling in terms of your own fund strategy. Um, but then also when you're looking to invest in a startup, you need to be able to, you know, do the quantitative analysis on whether that in particular investment makes sense from a returns perspective, uh, from a financial modeling perspective, et cetera. Um, and then the one thing that I think completely sets venture apart and, um, you know, at least attracted me most to it compared to say consulting or banking or, you know, some of the more traditional paths that people coming from booth um, tend to have is that VC really offers a blank canvas to imagine the future. So that creative production aspect, that ability to, for VC to be an outlet for your creative spirit, I think fundamentally uh, it's similar to wanting to be an entrepreneur and like building your own company. I think from that perspective, um, you know, I was actually talking to someone earlier today and I was like, so what's your advice if someone wants to be a venture capitalist? And they said, well, you need to have the same entrepreneurial spirit as the founders that you want to back because collectively you're imagining the future. And while the founder is giving up his whole life to that one particular endeavor, you're committing to that founder with their capital with just as much conviction. Um, but I also think that this is like the, the most unique and the most exciting aspect about VC. Uh, you get to learn about cutting edge technologies, business models, envision a new company um, based only on a business plan and a team. Um, and, you know, potentially back what may be world changing ideas. So, um, and I think that's fundamentally what sets VC apart from, I guess, some of the other high powered careers that um, Boot sort of tees you up for. Um, then next slide. Some of the attributes of people who are in venture capital, uh, power orientation is a big, big aspect of it. Um, you are, you know, in some ways, the prettiest girl in the room, um, or use that as a metaphor when you're a VC and you're attending any like tech event or tech party. Um, so, you know, and I guess like one big aspect of that is you have to kind of like not let that get to you in terms of ego and stuff. Um, yeah, that, that ability to use power effectively to take risks uh, in a, you know, non-emotional sort of very objective manner and also be able to assert oneself when, when needed. Um, I think some of the best VCs can combine those skills uh, in, in, in a really powerful way, um, particularly yeah, like board meetings and when you're invested, you know, some of the tough decisions that you need to make, things like that. 
Um, big picture mentality, passion for industry. Um, you know, industry experience is helpful, but it's not a requirement. Uh, fundamentally, that the, the key is that you demonstrate curiosity for you know particular markets or in, of an industry. Um, you might have deep sector expertise based on like, your prior background working in you know a particular area such as fintech or deep tech or enterprise tech. Um, but as you know, like industries evolve and, you know, particularly if you're at the at bleeding or cutting edge of technology, stuff moves really, really fast. Um, so curiosity is a really big element of wanting to do VC because what you know today is going to be outdated in five years. So as long as you can show that you can think big picture and learn quickly and show a deep level of curiosity, be able to do market maps, understand the micro macro drivers of, you know, certain trends. Um, that's what really matters. Um, and, uh, and people who, who have long career, long and successful careers in VC, they, they definitely um, have that big picture mentality. Um, Self-directed is, is unique about, v, uh, about VC. Even the most junior employee at venture funds like analysts, they're not really told what to do on a daily basis. Um, typically you only meet your partners um, maybe once a week at partners meetings for a couple of hours. Uh, they're usually traveling or they're super busy. Uh, there's not a lot of other people in the firm to guide you. So, it, you know, in some ways, it's it's very much um, an industry where you have to kind of just seek out opportunities for yourself, both to like market yourself, market the firm, um, and kind of guide your own career. Um, so it can be daunting, but also rewarding for you know people who are fundamentally super motivated, curious, self-directed, um, and have that level of maturity to be able to do that. Um, and then proven track record. So you know I think fundamentally what Having a proof, proven track record proves is that you have the capacity to think broadly and strategically about an industry and then apply it to a specific company. Um, it's very hard to gauge that upfront if you say, I want to be a venture capitalist, but if you have a proven track record of success, maybe as a founder or you know, in, a, in a particular industry, you've like had, um, you've shown um, the ability to take risks and like lead uh, uh, a new sort of pathway um, then you know that that can go a long way, not only to get a job in VC, but then also to identify other people, other teams like who have that ability, uh, and also to convince them to take capital from you because you understand them on a more sort of empathetic level. Areas of expertise, and these are things you can learn. You know, a lot of you have probably learned um, aspects of these at Booth and also um, in your jobs that that you guys are in currently. Uh, transaction structuring, so that's really table stakes. You should be able to. It's not the same level of transaction structuring as say one needs for um, investment banking or you know like people who work in in debt or private equity. Um, the level of modeling is a lot simpler at particular early stage VC. It tends to get more and more complex as you're going to growth equity and then uh, private equity. Um, but you know you should still be able to do stuff like building a simple PL statement and then coming up with a valuation, um, knowing which valuation methods to use for like, you know, the, the particular stage of a company. And then also being able to like project out, okay, so like given this model, this is, you know, reasonable exit. Um, if we own so much of the company and we get diluted down by so much and so many rounds going forward, then this is what the waterfall looks like and that'll drive so much IRR. That's really like, it, sound, it may sound complicated to some of you, but it's really not all that hard. Uh, but it isn't, you know, there is an element of like transaction structuring because there's also a lot of other things that go into this, uh, particularly as you're negotiating terms, um, you know, uh, as you lead deals and you have a term sheet that you need to be able to um, negotiate with the founder. Um, so, but again, like those are things that you sort of like learn on the job. You should know like the basics of it, um, but a lot of it is, is sort of like learned on the job. Um, operations experience, that's something you cannot learn on the job per se in VC because you're not running a company yourself. So if you have prior experience either at a startup or you know a, a VC uh, or, or a large tech company um, or in just in general, like if you've actually, if there's any sort of operation experience in your background that, that can go a long way, particularly as you're looking to you know, provide that input as, as on top of the capital that you, you're providing to your portfolio companies. Uh, negotiating chops, um, that's something, again, you get better and better as, as you learn more about transaction structuring. Um, and then financial modeling, we already spoke about that. So um, these are some, you know, these are really like two skills that you can develop. I think it's, it's not necessarily an attitude thing, which is the prior two slides. Um, and, uh, um, and again, like 
a lot of booties have aspects of this already sort of covered. So, um, so the next thing that I want to get into is, you know, talk a little bit more around like what are uh, typically the backgrounds of people who get into venture capital. I know 10 years ago when I wanted to do VC, I was like, oh, well, I guess you have to do a little bit of investment banking and then maybe get an MBA and then you break into venture capital. Um, and I always thought like a lot of other industries that it's a very linear path. Um, and, you know, I couldn't have been, and maybe the industry has evolved over the last 10 years, but I couldn't have been more wrong. Um, we see today attracts a very diverse set of people. Um, and by diversity, it's not just diversity of say race or gender, but that's also grown a lot in particular over the last two years, but really diversity from, you know, from a perspective of your prior experience, prior background. Uh, there's really no traditional path uh, and no single job that will absolutely guarantee you or even exclude you from wanting to do BC, VC. You could, you know, be, you could not have an MBA at all, or you could be pre-MBA or post-MBA. You could be a veteran. Um, you could have insights about marketing or sales or, you know, uh, a focus on driving a certain type of impact. Um, really, it's venture cap, you know, VCs are taking capital to drive change in the world in in a particular manner that they can so, sort of like connect the dots to their prior background. So as long as you can build a good story as to why, what you've seen in the past and what is your passion in terms of like driving change to improve the human condition from like what you've seen in the past, uh, that's, that's what matters the most. How do you connect those dots as opposed to like checking the boxes in terms of have you done investment banking or consulting or product? That really doesn't matter as much. Um, so long story short, um, there is no traditional prior background, no traditional path. Um, roles that typically you, you know, people tend to have in venture capital are, you know, analyst, uh, usually, uh, tends to be on the younger side. You have zero to three years of total work experience. You know, most, most of these people are pre MBA. Um, associate is typically three to five years of work experience. And when I say work experience, it's like total work experience. It doesn't have to be in venture capital, um, just like overall industry work experience. Um, associates can be both pre-MBA and post-MBA, senior associates, usually post-MBA. Um, VP principal um, is typically five to seven years of work experience. Um, some corporate venture capital firms also have a title of a director. Um, which is, you know, similar to a VP or a principal. Um, then you have partners or managing directors, typically at corporate venture capital firms. There's, that's usually more than five to seven years of work experience. And then general partners typically tend to be the folks who um, launch their own funds. Um, and they're the ones who really have the equity in the fund. So they're typically the guys who've either like, they created a particular fund or, you know, they've been there long enough to earn the right to have a reasonable equity stake and be called a general partner. Um, in a fund. So um, these are typically the roles in um, at most venture capital firms. Um, and uh, I guess like when, you know, typically starting at like VP levels and above, um, the number of years of experience in venture also start to matter. It's not just total work experience. Um, so, you know, it, um, so, but once you've had about two years of work experience in venture, that's that's usually a pretty good, pretty good sort of bar as long as you have a total of five to seven to make a case as long and you know to the extent that your track record is good to make a case to want to be a principal or a partner uh, at a particular fund. Other roles in so, venture. Uh, uh, yeah. Quick question on that uh, one side back. Mm -hmm. So someone who's like an experienced person out of an MBA several years, th this would imply they're probably going to get a senior associate position if they are successful in getting yeah there's a little little bit was that the question or was there a second part to the question as well that's that's the question is was is that the expectation like people don't automatically just be have to work their way up but if you're experienced in fpna or investment mm -hmm. banking or, or whatever industry you know you can go in and and pretty much Go right in the middle like not at the vp level but probably one below that's correct like after an mba in particularly if you have multiple years of work experience um and like if you particularly if you've done investment banking or even if you've done operations there's something that you're bringing to the firm if you have like operational experience at a 
tech company or at a corporate, you know how to navigate sales or marketing or just general ops. If you have investment bank experience, so you you know how to do transaction structuring, you know how to do financial modeling. So you are so those years of work experience do count. Um, so typically, you know, you would after an MBA, you would come in at a senior associate title for whatever you know, like uh, that would be like your title. Not that titles really matter in venture as much. Most VCs you'll notice just call themselves investors. Um, Sometimes I've seen people come in as associates and sometimes I've also seen people come in as principal, um, but the baseline would be senior associate and then you can move up or down based on um, you know, the requirements of, of the fund. And if you can make a case for yourself to either be higher than a senior associate or maybe you have not that much relevant experience, so you end up being an associate. Some funds also don't have the distinction between associate and senior associate. So, um, so you might come in as associate as a result of that. Okay, thank you. Um, some of the other roles in venture, you might have seen these titles at you know uh, other funds that you guys are aware of. Venture partner, um, those are venture partners are not typically employed uh, folks at venture funds. They're the ones who um, who are you know partners. Like uh, a company has a partner with another company. Um, they support deal sourcing and managing investments, so they're not permanent members of the team. They might, you know, source deals and get in some upside in, um, in the success of that company, uh, or they might just basically be there to sort of provide, um, you know, provide their, lend their experience as you're due diligence companies or supporting portfolio companies. Um, so they're usually industry experts that are affiliated with your fund, um, and they use the title of venture partner. Operating partners, um, they typically are the folks who um, would, you know, help out with raising the fund, focus on strategic planning, scaling the fund, operational efficiencies, um, also maybe, you know, be in charge of portfolio support uh, and running the best dev organization um, and the network of your fund, all of the value added stuff that say, you know, your fund does. Uh, and they might even have a team under them that does, you know, portfolio support, best dev um, and, and the network aspect of your fund. And then you have entrepreneurs and residents um, who typically are people that you have sort of on your bench to help you support your portfolio companies. And typically they may either source a single deal or um, you know, just jump in and take up a role at one of your portfolio companies and sort of like ride that wave or maybe jump in and out from working with the portfolio companies and coming back to being on the bench and then maybe going to work with another portfolio company or maybe founding their own portfolio, uh, a company which ends up becoming your portfolio company. So those are some of the other ways to get involved with venture funds if you don't wanna be on the direct investing team. Um, and some of these are actually pretty rewarding as well um, because you know you can do some of these things part-time um, and really start to build that, uh, that knows for you know, how to invest um, in, in venture deals, or you might have a bent for wanting to go join a startup, but you don't know which startup to choose so you're like, okay, well, if I can go become an entrepreneur residence at a fund that I think highly of, and then just wait for the right opportunity to arise, that can be pretty rewarding as well. Um, so summing it all up, you know, various paths to, to getting into venture. Um, you might be a founder, prior founder, current founder, um, and then, you know, you create a company, you exit it, sell for one, two or three dollars as a metaphor. So it doesn't really matter how big of an exit you got. It's really about the experience of having founded a company that matters. Um, and then you either create or join a venture fund. Um, you're already an industry expert. And so, you know, you, you are a particular corporate, um, you have deep sector expertise, and then, you know, you, break, you go to a more sector specific fund or a generalist fund in charge of that specific sector. Uh, that's another path. Um, I guess the traditional path in quotes is you have a finance or consulting career, you know, get an MBA, do banking or consulting, and then join a venture fund. Um, one of the more interesting ones, and this is something that I've seen, I guess a reasonable amount um, now, is that a lot of people, they were, you know, they just, they just come from a wealthy background. And uh, in some ways, the barrier to entry to having a venture fund is capital. Um, so if you had access to that capital, be it your own family or, you know, somehow, you know, some rich folks and they'll give you some money, you become an angel investor and then you either create your own fund or you have, you develop the track record, which allows you to then join a fund. Um, 
And then the new sort of emerging way to get into venture nowadays is, uh, you know, like, I, I guess the other thing, the I, historically the issue that's been about getting, breaking into venture capital is the whole chicken and egg problem of like, I don't have investing experience and I don't have the capital to be, become an angel investor, but if I don't have investing experience then I won't get the job. So how do you break through that cycle? Um, so, you know, Booth has the VCPE lab, uh, which is basically what I did. And that was my internship at Jump Capital. Um, but then now there's also a lot of like, you know, scout programs and internships and structured VC education programs that exist that allow you to build that skill set, that allow you to build that investing track record um, and uh, and eventually make a case for joining, joining a fund. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about this later as well. Um, so what are the responsibilities when you're, you know, at a typical fund, particularly if you're on the investing team? Um, so big aspect, I guess like the main key takeaway here is that each firm has a different, um, you know, will need a different type of person. Uh, venture funds are typically relatively small, almost boutique type houses, shops, right? So like you, typical fund is probably like three to five people. Obviously the bigger funds are way, like in recent Horowitz is much bigger than that, but a typical venture fund is three to five people. Uh, and they're really looking to like fill the bench where uh, with you know complementary skill sets. So each fund will need a different type of person depending on what the rest of the team already has. Um, some of the factors that um, that you should consider as you're reaching out to funds is you know the size of the fund, uh, the stage of the investment cycle that they're in. So um, I, from a size perspective, the stereotype, and again that's just a stereotype. There's no rules out here. Is that Typically, the larger funds will want you to do more due diligence um, because they already have like a relatively well-established sourcing cycle um, and everything else is kind of running really well and they just need more hands on deck to help support the due diligence efforts. Um, the smaller funds will, you know, potentially want you to do a little bit more of the uh, portfolio support work. Um, so, you know, as you're talking to funds, you can ask, uh, ask them specifically, where is it that they need the most help with? Um, in terms of stage, the stage that I'm referring to out here is really, you know, what stage of deploying capital they're in. So funds are typically 10 years long. Um, they will, you know, raise the fund, call it a hundred million dollar fund, then maybe spend the first three to four years deploying that capital. Um, and then a couple of years of, you know, three to four years of supporting those companies that they invested in. And then they get to like the harvesting stage. Um, Typically, funds are also stacked. So, you know, I just read the statistic today that um, VCs that tend to raise follow-on funds like fund two, fund three, fund four, they typically raise every two and a half to three years. So typically, you know, once you're done investing from your first fund, you'll go on to raise your second, third, fourth fund every two to three years. Um, so it's helpful to know as you're reaching out to a venture fund what stage they're in, um, because accordingly, you know, your experience will, will defer. So if you're coming in, right when they just announced a fund, you'll be doing a lot more investments. If you're coming in sort of mid-cycle, you might be helping them either raise their second or third or fourth fund, uh, basically a subsequent fund, and you'll also be helping out a lot with like portfolio support. Um, if you're coming sort of end of life of a fund, then um, again, you might be helping them raise a subsequent fund, you might be helping them with like the exits. Um, so it's, it's important to understand where the fund is in terms of its stage. And then obviously, you know, what is the investment focus? So you can accordingly tailor, tailor your outreach and also fit. Um, and so, you know, big, big aspect of that is understanding your own skills, background, interests, uh, so you can, um, so you know what you're bringing to the table and if you can really be a value add to the team or not. Um, VC recruiting is really a marathon and not a sprint. So it's not like recruiting at Booth where, you know, they have a specific season. Some firms also do super days and then, you're basically done within a span of a week or a month. Uh, you really have to take a long-term approach to venture investing. It's really about building relationships. Uh, a lot of firms will typically want to test drive you first. Uh, they'll want you to get to know everyone on the investment team. They might even have you work on a deal or at least various aspects of that specific deal. So everyone gets a, you know, an idea of like how coachable you are, what's your attitude like, if they really can, you know, work with you in, in a in a in a small team setting, um, so it's it can it can be a little bit, um, I guess, 
like feedback cycles are long in general in this industry. So as you're looking to break in, it can be a little frustrating, but I think if you just take that approach that this is more of a marathon and I'm just building relationships with every touch point at every fund that I meet, then that's a really good attitude towards, you know, just believing that something will materialize and just casting a wide net from that perspective. Um, so take a long-term approach. Uh, typically, what are you doing at these funds is, you know, you're doing due diligence, you're doing analytical uh, modeling, um, you're blending your industry expertise, and you're doing your founder operator support. Um, so these are really, you know, the tasks that one does um, at, at a venture fund. Um, so just elaborating a little bit, um, in, you know, into that, actually, there might be a question. Yeah, I was thinking maybe you'd take a few questions now. Might be yep. Good time. Um, shall I just start at the top? Yeah. Cool. So the first question is, how does one go about learning to understand the deal terms of VC investing and the key terms to evaluate if they're not currently not in VC? Yeah, so that's a great question. And that's the whole sort of chicken and egg problem, right, that I spoke about. Um, I think really the way to do it is um, learning by doing. Um, and there are various, and we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit further down as well, but um, angel investing is a great way to do it, right? And you just have to set aside a small amount of capital, maybe five grand a year. Uh, I know a lot of angel investors, in fact, Hustle Fund, which is now uh, on its second fund, they started off writing like $1,000 checks. Um, and um, they did that for a few years and you know, sort of learned how to, how to invest in companies, learned how what the different terms mean. And now they've raised on, gone on to raise two funds. So the simplest or like the most impactful way to do so is to just start investing. Um, join an angel group um, or, you know, find your own deals and, uh, and then read up as you go along. Uh, you have all the, like the internet has a ton, ton of resources in terms of like how to understand deal terms. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, you can take it to the next level by creating SPVs and your own syndicate and basically just rolling with that. Um, but joining an angel group is probably the best start if you're coming, starting completely cold because you'll meet other people there as well and you'll just learn from them. Um, the next question is, could you share the links to the groups you mentioned for those interested in learning, joining the community? Yep, um, I'll do that. There's actually, uh, right at the end of the presentation, I have uh, a resources slide with a bunch of links. Uh, when you say stage of investment, are you talking about PE recruiting or the different stages of VC investing, which I thought was just early stage angel series A? Yeah, so I think I clarified that. Um, so when I said stage, it was more about the stage that the fund is in. Are they in the investing phase? Are they in the uh, support stage or in the harvesting stage? Um, and at what point will they be raising the next fund? That's what I meant. Um, then the next question is, I have an interview coming up asking for investment thesis presentation. The firm's focus areas are very broad. How broad or narrow should I focus my investment thesis? That's a really good question. And just hold on to that um, because I'm gonna to come to that as well. Um, could you talk about how much VCs value the corporate venture fund experience? Several technical managers firms that have these corporate funds, vision and strategic assets. Yeah, I mean, like you're doing this, your job at a corporate venture fund is the same as a traditional venture fund, which is uh, source deals, uh, assess deals, have that judgment and invest in companies and then support them. So, you know, it's, it's exactly the same job that you do. May, the only thing that you may not be doing is you're not raising your own fund. Uh, you're not reaching out to LPs, which can be both good and bad because A, you're not wasting your time doing that. Um, you know, that's a lot of, that's just a lot of meetings and it can be just as uh, difficult as say a startup raising capital for, for their startup. Um, but in terms of like actual investing, I investing sort of knows that you're building, it's the same as a traditional venture fund. So I would say if you have an option to go join a traditional venture fund, take that up, but then also consider your own economics of joining the traditional venture fund. You know, if like you might, the oftentimes like the payout structure differs between traditional versus corporate, you might have a higher salary in corporate and more of a guaranteed or not guaranteed but on target bonus as opposed to carry whereas in traditional you might have more of a carry type pay structure uh, but again all of that is open to negotiation on both sides uh, and in terms of experience it's very similar I think 
historically, um, there has been this, um, you know, often historically the advice has been, if you can get into a traditional venture fund and do that, the next best thing is corporate. Um, I think corporates are, corporate venture funds are getting more and more institutionalized and uh, corporates are also, again, historically the, the notion has been that when the company hits a, you know, when the economy hits a bad patch, the first thing that gets cut is a corporate venture fund. I think what we've seen more recently is that corporates are tending to, to stick with their thesis of having a corporate venture fund um, more. And uh, so as they get more institutionalized, more professionalized, as your economics are improving and then more, you know, from, a, I guess, um, and this is a long discussion, but like one thing that corporates are now starting to do is to create like annual vintages of funds um, and aligning your incentives in that way. Um, you could potentially even negotiate to get like deal by deal carry in a corporate venture fund, which is, which can be really lucrative. Um, so long answer short, it doesn't really matter. Um, it's, uh, if, if you want to just partner up with incredible startups and support them and grow them and be part of that journey, it doesn't really matter if you're corporate or traditional. Um, how does one leverage deep industry experience into working at a VC? How does one begin the search to find such opportunities? Um, yeah, so just hold on to that question as well, because I think as we go through this uh, discussion, we'll, we'll touch upon those, those topics as well. Um, so this slide is really the life of a VC investor. We sort of spoke about this, you know, it takes about six to 18 months just to raise your first fund, right? You're like taking all these LP meetings. Um, was being to hustle fund yesterday. They took 700 meetings to raise their first $10 million fund. Now that's like, like the, I'm sure all of you guys have read about Airbnb and the number of meetings they took to raise their first round of funding. This is much more hard work than the amount of work Airbnb put in to raise their first fund. So it's it can be a lot of work to just convince LPs to give you capital to raise your first fund. Most of you will probably go and join an existing fund and not start your own fund. Um, but you know, just to give an appreciation of how, how difficult it can be to raise your first venture fund. Um, then once you're at a fund, you're typically deal sourcing, doing due diligence. Um, funds typically do Monday meetings called partner meetings where they review top deals from that particular week. Um, and then the deals that they want to dive a little bit deeper into, they'll do you know deeper due diligence on them and eventually do an investment committee, which is where they make the decision if they want to invest or not. Um, then, you know, starting years two to seven in the life cycle of the fund, uh, you're deciding if you want to follow on in your, in your first checks and build up bigger stakes in your winners. Uh, and, you know, just doing a lot of portfolio management. Um, so you're helping your portfolio companies succeed, raise future capital, both from your fund, but also, you know, other funds that you can make introductions to. You're participating on the board meetings. You're helping them get clients, uh, partners, employees, advisors. So there's a lot of work that goes into that. Um, and it can really, you know, be a full-time job in itself. Um, then a lot of work on LP reporting, quarterly, annual, um, more ad hoc as well where you have to keep, you know, inform your LPs. LPs are the folks who've given you money in the first place to deploy in startups. So you need to keep them up to date on your portfolio. And then eventually, you know, uh, driving those exits. Um, in venture speak, it's called harvesting, where you're driving um, M&A or IPO exits for your startups. Now, again, like the best companies in your portfolio, they tend to sell themselves. But your job as a portfolio manager is to help every single company and try and make sure that, you know, you're really fighting for your LPs um, to get them their money back. So um, I've seen a lot of VCs take relatively active positions. Actually, one of the VCs that um, that I know in a portfolio company, he ended up, um, run. he's been running this company for the last one year. Uh, and now they're actually bringing in new management. They had some issues with the old management. Um, and then he ended up having to run the company. So, you know, that, that's just, um, that's pretty pretty incredible and laudable. So um, a lot of work can go into that. Um, how to stay within VC industry, VCP industry and grow your career. So, you know, again, multiple different pathways. Uh, there's no standard, but um, between these pathways, I think you can see what the different options are. Um, the traditional routes, uh, or I guess one route is to start at whatever level you start, call it analyst and just grow within the fund. 
Um, that's easier to do at larger funds. Um, at smaller funds, it's a, it's like startups, where it's a little bit more ad hoc. You don't really know the direction the fund goes in and then how many seats open up for you to grow within the fund. Um, so uh, the more sort of common path is to grow and leave. So you start, you sort of grow to partner or principal level, uh, and then maybe do your own fund, um, uh, starting out with a small fund and tr to try and grow that. Um, and then, you know, if you may leave and come back, so uh, you, you watered a particular fund, you then go and join a portfolio company um, or, or any other sort of startup to gain that operating experience. And then you go back to your particular fund or to any other fund in a more senior role. Um, you might come from an accelerator or corporate VC and go join a traditional venture fund. Um, a lot of people turn from corporate uh, to another fund or start their own fund. Um, I think to going back to my point, we're seeing corporates as they get more and more institutionalized, as I mentioned, that this is not, um, you know, a lot of people are just staying in corporate and uh, to the extent that they have the backing of the corporate, they're very happy there. Um, then you also have, you know, people who go from VC to PE, um, particularly as their portfolio companies grow, you know, they have a stable of companies and they have those relationships and that's what PE cares about. So you get hired at a PE fund because you just have relationships with all these companies. Um, usually it's not that common to see PE to VC because it's a very different sort of, you're taking a higher level of risk in VC than PE. And a lot of people don't want to, as they get further in their career, they don't want to go into a position of more risk. Um, even though a lot of PE folks I've spoken to, they wish that they'd done VC because that's where you can really drive, you know, bigger impact, um, both from, you know, from a world changing perspective and also from the ability to drive higher IRRs. Uh, but it's also way more risky. So you don't see a lot of people going from P to VC, but the other way around is, is, is relatively common. Um, and then, you know, you could move on to fund of funds where you invest in other people's funds. Um, that's, uh, that's not a bad path at all either, because, you know, typically then you're sitting in a really big pile of money and VC is coming pitch to you and you're sort of deciding if you want to invest in them. Um, but basically, I guess, long story short, Fundamentally, the three things that, you know, being in VC boils down to is, can you find a deal, i.e. source? Can you pick a deal? Uh, do you have a good nose for it? Can you do good due diligence? Um, and then can you help your portfolio companies? And really it's just, you know, just remember these three things and um, the rest sort of will fall in place as a result. Um, and I guess the one sort of common element across all of these three things is your network. Um, so, you know, sourcing obviously is a big, big function of your network, who you know, if you have access, a unique access to specific companies, uh, can you source better than, you know, the next person at another VC fund? So a big aspect of that is your network. Um, picking a deal is both a combination of, you know, just your own mental models of startups, of tech companies, but also, do you know the right people? Do you know someone who knows someone? Uh, who can, you know, help you go, do good due diligence and ask and basically get answers to the right questions. Um, so that's a big function of a network as well. And then helping your portfolio companies really boils down to three things. Um, bring them additional capital, bring them uh, employees uh, as they grow, and also um, bring them, you know, customers, which are all elements of your network. So one thing that you know, I would highly, highly recommend everyone who's serious about breaking into venture capital is to start working on developing your network today. Don't wait till you already wear the VC hat. It is a lot easier once you are already wearing a VC hat. And some of the things on the slide, um, you know, you might get a bit of an imposter syndrome trying to do that right now. But like, pick, pick and choose some of these things and start working on them already. Um, you know, you can. If you're particularly from Silicon Valley or any sort of big city where, you know, the startup ecosystem across the U.S. is really growing in every city right now, there's tons and tons of events happening. There's a mailing list called Gary's Guide that you can go and join, just Google for it. And then, you know, there's a there's one, um, Gary or whoever runs Gary's Guide basically sends out an email Monday morning, every Monday for your specific city. So just have an eye on like all the startup events that are happening. Um, and, you know, sign up for, to go to at least one or two every week. Um, that like in itself, one, I guess initially it can feel a little bit 
low ROI, but over time, as you start to get to know and meet the same people at these events, uh, that's just a really, really good way to start building a brand in your network. Um, meetups, Eventbrite, you know, mixers, they're really great. So just go to meetup.com or Eventbrite and put in your keywords that you're searching for and tons of events come up. I literally, that's, that's literally how I started out like three years ago. Um, and, uh, um, and there is, there's a lot of value to, you know, even going to seemingly random events because maybe the companies presenting there are not that interesting, but it's about the people who you meet there and then you'll meet them at other events. Um, demo days is sort of bread and butter for VCs, right? Like all VCs go to, uh, at least the most popular demo days. And then also the demo days of companies that, of industries that they're interested in. So YC is probably the most famous accelerator. Um, YC does two demo days a year, uh, 200 companies at each demo day. Um, YC tends to be a little bit invitation only. Uh, but again, if you can, you know, figure out a way to get, they do invite angels. So if you can figure out a way to, to get that invitation, that's great. Um, and then there's tons of other accelerators now, Techstars, Alchemist, you know, there's multiple accelerators in every city. So start to get involved with them, start mentoring, coaching, startups at those accelerators, it's pretty easy to reach out to them. They're always looking for people who can just, you know, uh, come in and mentor their startups. Um, so figure out an angle, like you might have prior finance experience and you could, you might be able to build models and basically help startups, you know, raise capital. You might have prior consulting experience and you might be able to like strategize and come up with business strategy for a particular startup. You might just have direct prior operations experience um, and you might be able to help, you know, the founder think through how to, what tools to use and how to basically build an organization and how to scale it. So all there's, there's probably something you can help the company with because the founder's time is so limited and they're just learning everything on the fly. Um, so figure out what that value add is that you can add, um, reach out to the incubator accelerator. As a result, you'll get access to their startups. As a result, you start to like get deeper into the ecosystem and also start getting invites for demo days at other accelerators and incubators. Um, then the next thing, and this is, very much like, you know, this is very much what VCs do, but you can already start doing it now is deal flow sharing calls, right? So um, once you've built up a bit of a base, you've gained the confidence that you have reasonably good investable opportunities to talk about, then you can set up a call with, you know, a professional in the, in the industry, or maybe someone like yourself who is an angel as well. Um, and just do a monthly or quarterly check-in and be like, Hey, these are the companies that I'm working with and what are the companies that you're looking at and just exchange notes and maybe you guys end up co-investing or just, you know, or at least like uh, discussing some of the top deals that I've, both of you have seen. And if you do enough of these, you'll really build up a strong base of companies that are within your sort of arm's length distance of reaching out to. Um, and fundamentally, that's what, you know, VCs are looking for when they're first hiring you is like, can you source deals? So if you can say, well, I know so-and-so at these three different angel groups and at that fund and that fund, and I do quarterly calls with all of them, uh, you know, you'll make a really, really good impression when you're recruiting for venture capital. Um, conferences, you might be doing some of them already as part of your day job. Um, you know, again, don't go out of your way if, it, if it's industry specific and it relates to your area of interest, then, um, then it's, it's totally worth it. Um, and then, you know, interview startups. So that's, again, a great way to, to start to generate some content um, and also to aid, well, to generate some content, build your brand, but also to uh, learn yourself, you know, like what's happening in the ecosystem. So if you interview startups or if you interview people that are connected to the ecosystem, there are folks like Jason Calcanis that are really famous now, but fundamentally they've built their entire empire on the back of basically interviewing and connecting people. Um, and, you know, with the internet and with podcasts and all these different platforms where you can host your podcast, it's super easy to start your own sort of um, interview series. Um, and uh, it might just be, you know, for your own learning, you might be curious about a certain area. Like I've been doing a lot of reading recently on how to build a sales organization and what are the different stages of a startup and who, who should they be hiring when they're like a seed state startup and what kind of person should they be hiring at like a series B or C state startup. So maybe that's just your personal curiosity. And as you learn that, you speak to industry experts and maybe record that and turn that into a blog or an interview series. Just some ideas on, you know, like it's super approachable to do these things, um, particularly in today's context. Um, organize events and dinners. These dinners could literally just be, I, again, Jason Kalkanis started out organizing dinners. 
Uh, but these dinners could just be, you know, your booth classmates who are in different industries and you bring them together and you guys just catch up socially and, you know, stuff comes out of that. Uh, but at least you you start to tell your network that this is an area of interest beyond what you're doing right now, um, you know, in your in your day job. The next thing that you want to be doing is, you know, really building your own brand on top of the network that you're starting to work towards. Um, part of that is blogging, answering questions on Quora. Multiple VCs, Andrew Chen, um, another one I'm forgetting the name. They started out like just like being experts in Quora. There's a lot of bad advice on Quora and not that much good advice. So if you, if if it even means that you know what the right answer is, but you go and research it and then post a thoughtful response, eventually you get upvoted and people will start to look up to you as like the expert in a particular field. Um, so it's a little bit of a hustle, but all of VC is a hustle. So, you know, you have to kind of envision the future self and start to like work towards that today. Um, email lists, again, like don't overthink it, but it can be as simple as emailing five friends with some interesting links. Uh, it could just be a summary of like the 20 tech newsletters that come out every day and just picking the five most interesting links out of those and sending them to your friends. Um, and then hopefully, you know, you'll be able to like grow that out. Um, social media. Social media is probably one of the most powerful tools in VC today. So most VCs are on Twitter. Uh, they get into these tweet storms all the time around trends, around, you know, inside startups. They use that to connect with each other. You can engage with them on Twitter uh, and, you know, uh, comment and start to understand what is it that they're looking at. So Twitter is really, really powerful from that perspective. To get in the flow and also to engage with certain VCs. Uh, and then LinkedIn is just really, really powerful to let your own network know uh, your expertise. So, you know, instead of writing a full blog, you could potentially like micro blog on LinkedIn and just post your thoughts in particular trends or inflection points in certain industries, uh, which will, you know, then start to signal to people within your network that that's an area of interest for you. Um, speaking at events. So, uh, you don't have to be a VC to speak at events. You could be, you know, uh, whatever you do right now, you're an expert in that. And you could potentially find an event to, you know, uh, to be an expert speaker. So, uh, so it, it, I guess like you don't have to do all these things and maybe some things you only want to do once you are in, you know, a professional investor. But I guess what I'm trying to say is that you can already start doing it to the extent that you're uh, super serious about building out those muscles. Um, another thing that is very approachable and I would highly recommend in going back to the investment thesis question is to do your own research. Build market maps, build uh, industry landscapes. Uh, you can even send these market maps as value add to VCs that you're looking to connect with. Um, it goes a long way to show that you're a deep thinker and a quick learner, and this is your ability to do research. So, uh, you know, come up with the research, put it on the internet, or just send it out to specific VCs who you think might find it useful, um, organize meetups, and, you know, you could even write a thin book based on, like, whatever your life experiences are and what you consider yourself to be an expert in. Um, so just some ideas on how to grow your network uh, in a relevant fashion and build your brand by creating resources and content that is relevant to VCs and startups. Um, and then, I guess, more tactically, you know, VCs are very, <clears throat> very used to looking at pitch decks. So um, you could develop your own personal pitch deck. Now, I'm not a big fan of resumes because resumes kind of try to like fit everyone in a very templatized fashion on a one piece of, you know, one sheet of paper. Um, and particularly if I'm hiring someone on a very small team of four to five people, I want to get to know them a little bit more holistically from a 360 degree perspective and not just from a purely professional sort of logos perspective. Um, so actually, personal pitch decks can go a really long way, and this is an example of a former colleague who's now working at a venture fund in, in London. Um, he's, he built this deck on himself where he talks about his interests, his, his sporting interests, his hobbies, his family, his professional experience, and also the companies that he's invested in as, as an angel. So again, it's not, it's not rock. It's probably easier to do one of these than to like build your resume. Um, and it can really lend to you know, an interesting discussion and a great way for you to differentiate yourself from everyone else who's sending a fairly bland resume to, to a job opportunity. Uh, part of that, either together with a personal pitch deck or separately is the investment thesis. And one of the questions was, how narrow or broad shall I be on the investment thesis? 
the way to build it. So I guess the short answer is be as narrow as you can be. Um, the long answer is you start macro at the high level and then you funnel it down to three very specific companies that you recommend uh, looking into for an investment. It's not a research report. It's not what you know a McKinsey or Goldman Sachs would publish with like hundreds of graphs and 200 pages of stuff that no one's gonna read. Um, this is, make it as targeted and as concise as possible. Eight to 10 pages is a great length um, where you have a couple of pages of like prior trends and background as to like, how did we get to where we're at today? But really like the reader of this is a VC and VCs wanna know what's gonna happen next and what are the areas that they should be looking at? And specifically, is there a company that they can invest in? Or maybe two or three different companies that they should look at to invest in to capitulate on a particular trend. So, you know, a couple of slides on historical trends. Where are we today? What is your hypothesis for like, what's gonna happen next? And is this a really, really big opportunity? Because again, like, there's tons and tons of great businesses, but there's not that many venture backable businesses because, you know, VCs are looking for really big market opportunities um, and companies that can get to a value of a billion or more. So when you're saying, well, this is going to happen next, it better be a really big opportunity. And so if you can market size that, uh, talk about some of the micro and macro trends, uh, and then also specifically talk about how do you evaluate companies in that specific sector or how do you evaluate teams that are going to be able to um you know to be able to drive alpha so to speak um and uh, capitalize on those trends so again like it's easy to say that really big market and and uh, you know a great team with a great product market fit and like um or like a team product fit and a team market fit but then define specifically what the criteria is that you're looking for in the team for that team product fit and the team market fit um, so, so I guess like my template for doing an investment thesis is two slides on historical perspective, a couple of slides on where we're at today, a couple of slides on like, what are the specific criteria that you're looking for to evaluate companies and that, uh, who are capitalizing on that trend. And then two or three sp specific recommendations on companies that are worth diving deeper into from an investment perspective and tailor that to the funds, uh, area of focus. And obviously you're not gonna have all the information because you know you haven't spoken to the founder of that company, um, but at least to the extent that you can get information from the public domain, list those companies and say, this is why I find this company interesting and this is the additional research that we need to do. So uh, that's a great sort of template for investment thesis. Uh, and then I guess like the final thing that you should be working on already is building founder references. You know, you, you wanna show that you can build Jenny and Rappo and empathetic relationships with the founders. Now, obviously, if you're a prior founder yourself, then that's one of the main reasons why you know a lot of people with operator and founder experience tend to 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 have an easier time, theoretically at least, getting into VC because they understand the founder mentality. But if you can, there's multiple other ways to prove that out. You could, you know, you could basically be an advisor to a lot of companies, and then when you're recruiting for for a role in venture, if you can provide references from specific founders, then that can go a really long way to uh, make a strong case for yourself. Uh, I'm gonna take a pause here for a question. Do you think one learns similar things by joining a LP, like an endowment fund, or do they do by directly joining a VC? Is the former an easy switch? Not at all. I, and again, this is my personal view, but when you're joining an LP, you're evaluating other fund managers. You're pretty far away from like specific investable opportunities in companies. Uh, you know, a typical, a typical VC is evaluating markets in particular companies and evaluating teams. But as an LP, you're evaluating a fund manager and you're, you're evaluating a much bigger macro strategy. You're really far away from like what's going on on the ground from a micro perspective. You're really far away from building that nose uh, when it comes to evaluating teams and evaluating, um, you know, operating performance of startups. So, I don't think it's an easy switch at all going from fund of funds to being at a VC. I think the other way around is actually easier. Um, so, but again, maybe, I, maybe I'm wrong, uh, but I haven't really actually seen anyone do that to go from fund of funds to going to direct investing. So then we, 
and I guess the next thing, and we've already spoken about this, I won't go too much into detail, but like start now. I, I've asked several VCs over the last six months, like if there was one thing they could tell a 10 year, 10 year younger version of themselves, like they go, if they could go back in time 10 years ago and what advice would they give to themselves? Pretty much the most common answer I get is they wish they'd started doing this sooner. Uh, they wish they just started writing angel checks and started to like source deals and started to, you know, uh, invest, um, no matter how small a check that they can get, they can, in fact, if you can convince a startup to take a 500 or a thousand dollar check, that's, that says something about you in a much bigger way than convincing a startup to take a $10 million check, because that means you really can win deals. Um, and you've really thought about like what your true value add is. Um, so, you know, to the extent that you can set aside a budget and just start making your investments. Um, yeah, and I guess the other thing that I want to highlight here is you can be both thesis driven and also opportunistic. So you can have a thesis based on your interest and your expertise, but also be opportunistic in terms of like what lands on your plate. Uh, uh, um. So going back to, you know, the key value props that we spoke about, what is it that you're being assessed on? Can you source a deal? It's a function of your network and having unique access. When you're recruiting for a fund, you need to be able to tell them why is it that you have unique access to a certain set of deals? So that's really like figuring out what your core strengths are and what sets you apart from the next person who wants the same job. Um, can you pick a deal? Now, again, if you start doing investing yourself and you have if you've built up that track record of maybe two or three or four or more deals, that's a great way to show how you pick deals. Um, having an investment thesis is another strong signaling function. Fundamentally, it shows that a quick learner, deep thinker, um, it doesn't really matter what your thesis is on to the extent that it somehow relates to the fund. Um, it's always gonna be like, you know, every thesis yields maybe one or two uh, investments. Uh, so if, you know, if the fund is like a fintech fund, it doesn't mean you need to boil the ocean on everything fintech. Just pick one narrow vertical and show them one piece. It's like a project where you're like, well, this is what I can do with lending or, you know, maybe maybe SME lending as, as, as narrow as that. And if you had me do the similar kind of research in other sectors, I could also like turn that out pretty quickly. Um, so keep your these TCs, these TCs narrow. Uh, and really just show that you're a quick learner, deep thinker. Um, and uh, and then, you know, can you pick a deal, like network that you can leverage for due diligence? And then can you help those companies, uh, founder references come in? Is, is really the best way to like prove out that you can actually help companies. Um, I'm gonna like maybe speed up a little bit now. Uh, so in terms of preparation, you know, it's, standard sort of like booth uh, career services advice where, um, you know, you can wait for the serendipitous moments or you can really like go and create them. Uh, the way to create it is to get organized around it. So create a target list of funds, position, people. Um, how do you find out about these funds? There's, you know, if you just Google for like lists of VCs uh, and you can qualify those searches, there's tons and tons of lists on Google. Um, there's also like job postings like John Gannon has, has uh, is probably the most famous person, blogger who has like a bunch of uh, job listings for VCs, but really like what do you, what you want to do is specifically target funds and positions and people as opposed to like going and applying for a job. So like find VCs that inspire you, uh, find funds that inspire you and build a list. Um, you can look at Crunchbase, PitchBook, AngelList. Those are great resources as well. Great databases. Uh, subscribe to all the newsletters and publications. There's tons. And I have some resources at the back of the slide. Uh, in terms of recommendations um, and really leverage social media and Google um, to prepare that list of uh, funds and people that you're interested in. Uh, next step would be to you know, conduct your outreach. Uh, warm intros like any industry are always the best. Um, you know, ask your network, see, check your LinkedIn, check other, check, you probably know, you know some founders. So like speak to those founders that you know and they might be able to make some introductions for you and just generally your broader network of classmates uh, and professional acquaintances. Um, and I guess like the thing to keep in mind is when you do get an intro, don't go and ask the, you know, like take a value add approach of whether it's a cold outreach or a warm intro. Uh, 
think about like what is it that the VC will benefit from if, we, if that VC is going to give you 20 or 30 minutes of their time. And fundamentally, what they're looking for is insights um, or uh, in a particular industry or even more specifically, investable opportunities. So have a few ready um, and, you know, like be able to talk talk about them. And, and in fact, like in your initial outreach itself, just say, you know, you could be like, hey, I've been looking at the space. I see that you're super interested based on these portfolio companies. Uh, I'd love to connect with you be because I might have some interesting companies that uh, you might want to take a look at. So something along those lines where you're giving them some value. And even if they don't invest in those companies or they may not, you know, they may not really um, think that those companies are investable, at least they'll start to get a feel for like your own uh, mental models and your own ability to value at startups. And if you do this often enough and you cast a wide net, you might be able to start building meaningful relationships uh, and really take it from there. Um, hustle is, you know, as we mentioned, is a big part of it. You're always hustling. You're actually hustling more when you are on the job. So you, it's best to just start doing it already. Um, and uh, really think of your time, your ability to research because uh, your ability to source deals and you know help portfolio companies do due diligence and support their portfolio companies um, as your value add as you're reaching out to uh, to funds. So kind of like doing the job before you have it. Um, show thoughtfulness when you're connecting with you know um, VCs. Um, it's it's not as fast paced as say banking, consulting, or you know any other job that you typically get coming out of school. So that's something that. Can take a little getting used to so prove that you understand that by demonstrating thoughtfulness and deep thinking around strategies for sourcing due diligence and vending and supporting companies um and uh and i guess like the other thing is specifically there's a job posting but for the most part you might there might not even be a job posting and you really have to get them to create a position for you so what you really have to do is understand how a particular fund works um so say you're at the bottom the red dot you know, there's a, there's a layer of analysts and associates, and then there's maybe a recruiter, uh, and then eventually there's a partner who's a decision maker. You probably don't want to go reach out to the partner immediately. You probably want to start at the analyst associate level um, and, you know, really understand, like, go approach them with a value-added approach. Uh, they're probably super slammed with a bunch of stuff. So, you know, if you can help them out with sourcing and due diligence thing, and then really, like, pick their brains on, like, um, you know, what is it that you guys do? Do you do more deal support? Do you do more portfolio company support? Uh, what is a sourcing style? Different funds have different sourcing styles. Some funds will do a lot of cold calling. Some just leverage their own existing networks. Um, what is investing style? Are you guys more thesis driven or are you guys uh, more opportunistic? What is kind of like the, the, you know, split between the two? So as the more you can understand the way a fund works, the better you'll, um, be able to A, develop a more meaningful relationship um, with that particular person and B, just increase your chances that, you know, that person will become your internal champion when it comes to, in the future, as a position opens up, maybe a little bit for you to one of their partners. Um, so that's, you know, just keep this in mind. Um, so it's much more of a relationship game where you're giving a little bit of value, getting a little bit of value, getting to know each other and taking it from there. Um, Another thing that you can do, and this is a more recent sort of like development, is there's a lot of these university funds, right? Rough Draft Ventures, Dome Room Fund. Um, I guess Pair VC has a, has a program as well, Contrary Capital, the MBA Fund, uh, where you know, you're, source of, you're, you're at university or maybe at an educational institution, then you can source through your networks, you can source deals for these organizations, and you start to like build that investing muscle. Um, a lot of existing funds have scout programs. Um, my recommendation would be to find an existing fund with a structured scout program. If it's unstructured, you're not going to get a lot of value out of it. You're just going to be, you know, worst case scenario, it's as good as sending emails into a black hole. Best case scenario, they have a structured program where they're actually guiding you a little bit and allowing you to learn and grow as well. Uh, but a lot of VC funds have scout programs now. And then where I work, Venture University, we run like a full um, VC apprenticeship program, which is um, you know about 11 to 12 weeks long. Um, so that's another really, really great way to like learn in a more structured manner how to invest in startups and also start to build your investing track record. Um, what do you do now? 
make a plan based on some of the recommendations, start doing your outreach to industry contacts, uh, ask for coffee chats, and uh, start to develop some content and, you know, post blogs, videos, pictures, and start to build your brand on the, on the internet and then repeat and, you know, just go through the cycle multiple times. Um, where to begin? Well, I'm not gonna read through this whole thing, but fundamentally, like try and be authentic. If it feels like work, it's not the right tactic. tactic. Um, you might be an introvert, you might be an extrovert, you might be more comfortable speaking at events, or you might be more comfortable, you know, uh, writing blogs or tweets, tweet posts, but not as comfortable like speaking live. It really doesn't matter for a venture if you're an introvert or extrovert or what your personality is like, uh, as long as you can add value to the ecosystem. So figure out like what is, what works naturally with your personality in terms of getting your word out and your thought leadership out um, and, you know, start with that strategy. Um, VC really is an apprenticeship business. Uh, so, you know, the best way to do is, is learn by doing. And uh, here's some resources for, for everyone to kind of like get themselves started. So there've been a lot of questions just on resources if these can be made available so we'll try and work with alumni relations to see if the, these particular links can be made available and also the slides so this session's being recorded so it should be available on youtube the youtube channel after this talk so just to answer those questions just wanted to put that cool. out there there's also a couple of other questions shall i take them now yeah, you can take the uh, remaining questions and then we'll wrap up in, within a couple of minutes. Okay. So I think there's only one actually. So curious to okay. hear your views on search fund style VC investing, if any. Have recently reading about them, uh, where they raise capital, go and search for companies and improve it operationally and eventually sell it, I guess. Yeah, I mean, search funds have been growing, particularly in the Booth community. I think Stanford and Booth are probably the two schools that are leading the way in terms of like developing search funds, a bunch of my classmates have now done search funds. A bunch of my classmates have also tried doing a search fund um, and, you know, haven't really closed an acquisition yet. Um, I think, I don't think of search funds as VC. I think it's micro, micro PE, uh, where you're taking an existing business. There's already a product market fit. Um, there's already, you know, cash flows and you're restructuring it. You're potentially getting liquidity to, uh, you know, the original owner of the company who, who wants to maybe retire uh, and you're bringing in potentially, at least that's a stereotype, you're bringing in young blood, getting some quick, easy wins, doing some operational improvements and, you know, driving a higher valuation. Um, I did consider search funds five years ago, but I think the fundamentally the thing that held me back was that you really have to be open because you don't know where your acquisition is going to come from. It could be like in Nebraska, it could be in the Midwest, it could be East Coast, West Coast, wherever, right? So you need to like be really flexible in terms of where you end up. Uh, a buddy of mine from my class, he just closed on a search. Um, he's now running um, a duck cleaning business, a kitchen duck cleaning business in Milwaukee. And he used to be here in the Bay Area. Um, he loves it, but you know, he, he, and he was totally cool with like moving around. Um, so, so that's what he did. Another friend of mine from my class, he's been, his search took like two years and now finally he's acquired a business and he was also in the Bay Area, but now he's in Florida running a, you know, a tree sort of trimming business. So these are like typically non-tech, very traditional businesses, very like small enterprises um, where, you know, you can drive some quick wins and some operational improvements. Um, so it's a very different model from like investing in tech companies. Um, the other trend that, or, I mean, there's a few other people and we can go on, we can talk about this for like way longer, but another model is to try and acquire like, you know, smaller SaaS companies. And uh, cause a lot of them don't and cross the chasm, so to speak, which is like, they don't keep growing at, you know, the, the rate that VCs want them to grow. Um, but they're still great businesses and they're still like high margin tech businesses. So you build like a micro PE shop where you like become a holding company of multiple such businesses and you can potentially drive returns. A lot of people are going into that strategy as well. So that's like the next level from like middle market PE. Now you're going to like micro PE and you acquire uh, great tech businesses that are just not growing, you know, best in class uh, at best in class rates. So yeah, just some food for thought. Cool. Um, so I think we're out of time here. 
Uh, if anyone has any more questions, here's the contact information for Akash, the email and LinkedIn. Just wanted to take this opportunity to thank you, thank you, thank you so much for doing this. This was mm -hmm. amazing. I think we all learned a huge amount here and uh, I just, I thought it was, it was amazing to, to hear your story awesome. and your journey and, and your words of advice for everyone. Cool. And thank you, Ranga, for organizing this. Really appreciate everything that you're doing for the community. Absolutely. Okay, thanks, Akash. Thanks, everyone.